Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you. Would y'all stand this morning? We've got joy. We can worship together this morning.
for meeting us here today. Holy Spirit, we feel your presence. We acknowledge that you're here, right here in this moment. And we thank you for meeting us, Father. Father, with whatever we're walking through, Holy Spirit, we know you're meeting us in the exact moment where we are, whether that's good, whether that's bad, Holy Spirit, you're still meeting us here today. And we thank you for that. You don't condemn us. You let us approach the throne as we are today. And Father, I just invite everybody here, approach the throne. No condemnation, no shame. He takes you as you are. The veil was torn so we could approach the throne with grace. So Father, we approach you today. And we thank you for what you're doing in this house. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, give him glory, give him glory. We're so glad you worshiped with us today. Go ahead and say hi to two of your neighbors and you can go ahead and take a seat. City Hope, we are so glad that you're here. Here's what we have coming up at our church. Kingdom Builders is our annual giving initiative that goes above and beyond the tithe. So far in 2024, you have given $216,665. This is no small number and it's all because of you. This has allowed us to provide ongoing ministry support for several projects, such as Uganda Meals, India Gospel League, Christ Faith Home for Children in India, and even more beyond those. It's also allowed us to provide monthly support for several missions partners like missionaries in Honduras, Italy, and Russia, local partners like Protestant Pantry, Home of Grace, and Light of the Village, and even towards a new church plant in Houston, Texas called Eden Church. We've also set aside a significant portion towards the down payment of the Mobile Campus property purchase. Church, we could not do any of this without your unwavering generosity. To get more information and to give, go to cityhope.cc slash kingdombuilder. If you're ready to take the next step in publicly professing your faith, you can join us for our baptism class next Sunday. We have a class for adults and youth and a class designed specifically for kids too. This is a space to deepen your understanding of baptism. You can prepare your heart for this significant step and be inspired by the sharing of stories from others in the class. Don't miss this incredible opportunity to grow in your walk. You can sign up today at cityhope.cc slash baptism. Ladies, we will be having our daughter's night of worship on April 24th at our Malvis campus, and we are so excited. We've experienced years of unique conferences together and have consistently seen the fruit of that. So we are thrilled for this additional time to worship with you. It's going to be a night to worship the Lord through song and make space for the Holy Spirit to speak. So come expectant and invite a friend. We are in an exciting series right now called Let's Talk About It, where we're literally going to talk about it. Anything and everything that might be a hot cultural subject. If you want to dive deeper into last week's subject, we've created a resource page at cityhope.cc resources that has a selection of books related to each week's topic. Today, we're going to be talking about the church, deconstruction, and why the church matters. Next week, we'll be asking ourselves if we can trust the Bible. We know that the content of this series will help us understand these topics in a deeper way and equip us to be able to talk about it. So let's get ready and dive in. Hey, my name's Chris, I'm the Next Gen Pastor here, and I get to talk a little bit about Kingdom Builders this morning, but specifically one project that Kingdom Builders supports. If you don't know, Kingdom Builders is money that is given above and beyond the tithe to help us build and expand God's kingdom here on earth. One of the ways that we build and expand His kingdom is by emphasizing future Christian leaders. Basically, we invest in the next generation, and we do this a lot of ways, including helping our kids and youth get to camp every summer. Uh, I love every time we do baptisms, we hear many of our kids and youth talk about how at camp they experienced God or made a decision for Christ. I love that, that every year students are called into ministry or they choose to attend City Hope College, our ministry school, at camp. 
We've seen miracles. We've seen hundreds and hundreds of salvations and, and people deciding to get baptized. In fact, on the way in a couple weeks ago, I got stopped by Jason, one of our volunteers, and he was like, dude, got all my kids signed up for camp. It's the best investment I make every single year because there's just something special and unique that happens at camp. And a lot of that is possible through Kingdom Builders. This year, Kingdom Builders has a goal of $15,000 to help as many kids and youth attend camp as possible. And, and here's the thing with that, like anything above and beyond that 15 this year is gonna go to help us keep the cost down. You know, we all know that, that everything is more expensive these days. It costs $60 for two people to go to Chick-fil-A now, all right? But we're deciding not to go up on the cost of camp because we want as many families as possible to be able to participate. So pray for us this summer, partner with us, all right? And let's get as many kids and youth to camp as possible to experience that life change. We'll have our team in the lobby today to answer any questions or to help you and your family get signed up for camp. And hey, if this is your first time today, we wanna to welcome you and we want you to know this is a church that loves the next generation. We believe in the next generation. And if it is your first time, we'd love the chance to meet you. One of the ways we do that is a card in the seat back that says connect. If you would fill that out and then on your way out today, you can drop that off. And then lastly, before we, we hear our message today, we have a team right now in Honduras that is leading a teacher's conference. And we're gonna put their picture up on the screen today. And I thought before the message, it would be a great opportunity to pray for them. Hey, we don't just love the next generation here, but we are supporting and loving the next generation all across the globe. That's what your church is doing. So if everyone in this room, if you would extend a hand toward the screen and I want us to lift this team up today. God, I thank you for these people saying yes to you. God, I pray that you would give them favor with teachers. God, I pray that you give them favor with every kid and student they come into contact with. Protect them and keep them safe. And God, we ask that you would multiply their effectiveness in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, church, thank you so much today. Hey, I'm excited. Let's lean in for part two of our series. Let's talk about it. Welcome to church. Um, glad you're in the building. Is anybody excited to actually be at church this morning? Come on. Amen. If I haven't gotten a chance to meet you yet, my name is Jared. Uh, my wife and I, we've been on staff here for over a decade. Just recently at the beginning of the year, we went to Houston, Texas to plant a church, which is home for me. Uh, Eden Church family, if you're watching online, we loved you so much. We miss you guys. Uh, but it's good to be back with our City Hope family. Um, City Hope, can we just go ahead and, and even if you're in Mobile, Foley, you're watching online, we're gonna make some noise for our Eden Church cousins. Come on, that's family. I just want to show you a quick look at what the Lord's been doing in Houston, Texas. We said, you know what? Uh, we're not just going to Houston because Houston's big. We're going to the center. Uh, we're going to plant a garden in the center of the city. And, and the Lord just responded by connecting us with some incredible people. I just want to show you a couple of things really quick. This is us meeting at a coffee house in the middle of town. And this is just some of the folks that showed up. Can I tell you, hundreds of people have been drawn to this little coffee shop that somebody let us use for free. We know what it was going to be, but hundreds of people have just showed up and just said, you know what? I, I want to know what Jesus is doing here in Houston. But yeah, it's incredible. But really quick, what I also wanted to show you was this second picture, because we, we didn't just believe God was calling us to do this giant gathering. We had this vision of like, what would it look like if this, this gathering of people also met in homes as much as they met 
in churches or in coffee shops. And this is the beginning of that. This is our first Eden house. And there's another picture really quick as we split up in groups and we, we were pastored by different pastors. And we believe that that's starting in one house, but eventually it's gonna take root in the entire city. And there's gonna be churches that are meeting in homes all across the city. And we're gonna gather together and watch God do something incredible every weekend. Um, so if you give to Kingdom Builders, can I tell you that that gathering is not possible without you? We're planting churches. We're sending people across the globe to other cities. Why? Because the kingdom is here and we are experiencing it now. Everybody's saying the church is going away. No, it's not. Like God's here and he's moving and his spirit is moving. And we can't do it. Listen, we can't do it. We can't do it if we don't do it as a family. So thank you so much. Um, but we're in part two this morning. So I'm gonna go ahead and preach because that's enough. I, I, I loved on my church and I do love y'all so much, but I'm ready to preach. Um, we're in a series called Let's Talk About It. Last week, Pastor Trey said, you know what? I'm the pastor here. I'll take on the biggest weight. And in South Alabama, I'll take on politics. Come on. And y'all know y'all, hey, let's be honest. Y'all are a little crazy. Let's just be real, okay? Uh, no, but it was a phenomenal message. And uh, if you haven't yet, you need to go back, back and watch that. Uh, but today, we're gonna be talking about another subject that if you're a follower of Jesus, you, you've heard this subject talked about before. Now, Instagram and Twitter have made it trendy, but the truth is every single person who followed Jesus have some type of connection to this word. It's called deconstruction. It's called deconstruction. And so we're just gonna talk about it, if that's cool with you. Uh, but this idea, let me break it down um, in its simplest form because it's, it's meant so many different things to so many different people. But here's the basic definition of deconstruction. It's this. It's a, a critical dismantling of tradition and traditional modes of thought. So essentially, it's picking apart what we used to hold as tradition and saying, ah, in light of what I know now, where do I, where do I stand currently? Now, this may be an oversimplification of the word deconstruction, but the truth is we don't have time to walk through like four different semesters of postmodernism and philosophy to really explain the heart and the root and all that. We, we just have 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. But this just helps us kind of get on the same page just a little bit. It's picking apart tradition and saying, where do I stand? Uh, where do I stand currently? Right now, most researchers are saying that deconstruction or the pulling apart of traditions and then the consistent tenets of the Christian faith, that's actually happening faster today than it's ever happened in the history of our country. As a matter of fact, uh, Pew Research says that since the year 2000, Y2K, come on, some of y'all were still wearing baggy jeans and y'all switched over, now you're wearing skinny jeans, newsflash, you can come back, baggy jeans are okay. <laughs> um, but since then, since the year 2000 up until now, research says 40 million Americans have left church. So to put that in perspective, over the last 25 years, um, over 10% of the population in America total has left church. That's a mass exodus by, by anyone's standard. And this doesn't necessarily mean that these people stopped believing in God. And here's the truth. Deconstruction in its, in its root is not a, a process that can be a one size fits all. Everybody's uh, deconstruction process or journey looks completely different. But people do often give reasons why they leave organized Christianity. And the number one reason, this is not the only reason, but the number one reason why people cite as why they leave church or the organized church is because they got hurt in a faith space. The number one reason they cite, in other words, uh, for leaving church is because they got hurt at church. Uh, now, this morning, if it's okay with you, can we just be vulnerable for like two seconds? Because I'm gonna be honest, I've been hurt at church. And if you don't mind being real this morning, if you've been hurt at church, can I just see your hand? Seriously, keep it up. Keep it up. Look around. There's a whole lot of people. And the truth is, we're going to be talking about this topic specifically more in depth in the coming weeks. Um, but it's, this just goes to show you that, that one of the things that happens at church often is that people get hurt. But can I also let you know that anywhere where relationships are available, pain is imminent? 
Like if people are there, guess what? We getting our feelings hurt. <laughs> As a matter of fact, uh, I've been married for 10 years and um, we just, my wife and I, or we've been married for eight years, but we've been together for 10 years. Um, can I be honest about something about my relationship with my wife? Um, I've been hurt in marriage. <laughs> Not like that, like, in, oh, like she hurts my feelings, okay? Um, but so, she's scary too, let me just be real. <laughs> I've been hurt, I, I, remember, I remember early on in our marriage, uh, I had this bright idea one night, we'd only been married like a year or two. I was like, you know what, uh, it's gonna be a really fun night, let's hang out, like, let's watch a movie. And then we were just hanging out on the couch and you're like, you know what would be really cool right now? What if I just tickled her, you know? News flash, tickling is not funny, stop. Like, like, why do dudes think that that's a good idea? Like, you know, oh, it's a really great night. Nothing's going on. You know it would be funny if I tickled my wife. Come here, you know, it's weird. Stop. <laughs> but I was young, and I didn't know any better. Young husbands, let me let you know. Stop tickling your wife. It's not funny. She's going to hit you in the nose. <laughs> but one night we were hanging out. I tickled her, and then she just was too upset, and she finally just said it. She just said it. She went right at my heart. She said... Oh my gosh, you're annoying. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I have certain words that can take me back to childhood trauma. Annoying is one of them. <laughs> all, all in a matter of 14 seconds, I was brought back to middle school, Jared, and uh, I was going through a lot of things in seventh grade. First of all, I hadn't really found what my edge up was supposed to look like. And, and for most people, y'all don't really know what that means. Okay, so like, it's like a rite of passage for black folks. Like you, you finally like locking your edge up and you're like, this is me. <laughs> White people, y'all like kill a deer and you know, like wipe the blood on your face, you know? Like, oh yeah. <laughs> but for us, you know, like that's what, that's what we do. So seventh grade, I was dealing with a lot. I was going through some things. And um, this girl in the new friend group that I, I, I had connected with, she looked at me and my bad edge up and she said, listen, you're annoying. <laughs> so you, you imagine when my wife said the same thing, I was brought back to seventh grade, Jared, and I was hurt. But guess what? I also deconstructed. I, I looked at the pain that I just experienced. I looked at our relationship before that. I looked at my history and I had to decide after experiencing what I just experienced, after feeling the pain of what I just experienced, do I still believe what I believed when I said yes to marry my wife those couple years ago? I think we do this in our faith journey all the time. I think there's these moments when we get hurt and God doesn't come through like we thought he would. We see the election and we hear conservative Republicans uh, say that they're Christian and spew hate all over social media. And then we begin to wonder, is this how all Christians act? And then we hear the, the progressive liberals who say they're Christians too and they're spewing their own version of hate and they're saying, you know what, this is what it's supposed to look like. We're supposed to be culturally relevant and whatever the world says is okay, we say is okay. And then we begin to wonder, where do I belong? And we deconstruct. And we say, do I really believe what I believed when I said yes to Jesus? Something similar happens to Peter right after the crucifixion. When we read the Gospels, one of the, the hardest things to do is to really begin to capture the cultural context of that day. And for us to truly understand what the disciples were going through, the moment that they lost their leader, who was named Jesus, we have to begin to put ourselves in the mind of a first century, uh, first century Jew. Because here's the truth. The disciples didn't just lose a friend. If you understand the cultural context of that time, the disciples were thinking Jesus was not just this guy that you came to church to worship. In their mind, he was going to take over the Roman Empire. And he was going to become king, and they would be the friends of the king. That's, that's the thought process of these people during this time. And not only was he going to overthrow the, the Roman government, he was going to take over the world. And then that was uh, inexplicably intertwined with their scriptures at the time, their version of the Bible. So he was the Messiah, the Lord, the king. He was all of these things. So when he died on the cross, you have to understand that these people who had been following him for three years, they didn't just lose a friend, they lost their faith. They, they, they lost their, their faith. So it's no surprise that after the crucifixion, where we're gonna pick up in John chapter 21 is the, the moments following Jesus's crucifixion and resurrection. And I want you to see what the disciples are doing in this moment when they're dealing with the disappointment of losing their faith. 
John chapter 21. We're gonna start in verse one. It says this. It says, afterwards, Jesus appeared again to the disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And it happened in this way. Simon Peter, who was also just the apostle Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and the other two disciples were together. And, and here's what Peter says. He says, I'm going to fish. Come on, South Alabama. Y'all know y'all love that. <laughs> he says, I'm going to fish. And, and they said, you know, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And then early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore. But the disciples didn't realize that it was Jesus. And he calls out to them, friends, have you any fish? No, they answered. And then he said, then throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And then when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Now, if you're walking through um, deconstruction this morning, and, and you're, you're reading this passage of scripture, I wanna make some parallels for you, but here's the truth. It, maybe you're not walking through deconstruction, but you're dealing with some type of disappointment in your faith. I think that, that this is going to be good as we begin to exercise the process that Jesus gives the disciples. Here's the first thing I see Jesus asking the disciples to do, and it's the first thing I'm gonna ask you to do this morning. He says, why don't we begin again? Why don't we begin again? If the story about the fish and the miraculous catch and them throwing the net on the side, if you're, if you're starting to go, wait a minute, I think I've heard that before. You're right, because this is technically the second miracle catch. As a matter of fact, if we go all the way back to the beginning of Jesus's ministry, the same miracle happens to the exact same disciple. In Luke chapter five, verse four, it says this. It says, then when Jesus had finished speaking to the crowds, he was preaching, um, he says to Simon, who's Peter, he says, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. So Peter answered, Simon Peter answered, Master, we've worked all night. Are you beginning to see the parallels? And we haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So then when we see the resurrected Jesus in John chapter 21 approach Peter, it's, it's gotta be like deja vu for Peter, right? He's got to be thinking to himself, yo, I've seen this before. This is crazy. He's like, haven't we done this whole thing before? He's probably, he's probably a little bit freaked out. And, and then when he sees Jesus, he's thinking to himself, oh my goodness, this happened to me right before I started following Jesus. And then all of a sudden Jesus appears and it's happening to me uh, again. And then as Jesus shows up, you can imagine what Jesus is saying through this miracle. He's saying, let me, let me remind you of how it, how it started. And look, I know that you've been through a lot. I know that the journey didn't look like how you thought it was going to look. I know you thought I, that I was gonna overthrow the, the Roman empire and, and then rule the world. And then I thought that you weren't gonna deny me three times and you would stay by my side when I needed you most. But Peter, after all of the garbage, after all of the stuff that's happened after your church history, Hey, can we, can we begin again? And notice I didn't say start over because start over feels like you're erasing the past. Beginning again means you're coming back to the beginning, but it's still holding true what you've experienced before. Developmental psychologists often talk about this three-stage process that each human goes through as they begin to grow into a mature adult and they, they define it in three different ways stages. The first stage is called construction. And in this stage, you're given a set of beliefs and values, and you're told to craft a worldview. This is early childhood on into your early um, adolescence and later adolescence. And you're, when you're doing this, you're taking from your parents and the world around you, and you're saying, you know what? I'm going to craft a worldview that, that, that's going to help me walk through this life, and that's healthy. But oftentimes in this stage, things are black or they're white or they're they're, they're wrong or they're right. And, and, and everything in life is binary. You see two sides of the, uh, of the coin and you have to pick one. And some of those things are healthy, especially, especially when you're young. But oftentimes what begins to happen as you get a little bit older, you start to feel a little bit more uh, self-confident, right? And even you start to, to seem self-righteous and then you start talking about things as if you really know how the world works and, and people around you are going, ah, oh, you look like you think you know, but you really don't know. Anybody remember being a teenager before? <laughs> but then stage two happens 
And then stage two is called deconstruction. Because during these times, you begin to look at everything that you've been given and you start to question. You start to look at the, the, the parts of the worldview that you inherited from your parents and you go, well, that was harmful. It didn't really help me. I don't need that. The world says this is outdated. And you start to say, oh my goodness, everything I thought I knew, no longer do I know. But then hopefully you get to stage three. And if you get to stage three called reconstruction, as you rebuild your worldview, hopefully you, you lean on the advice from the elders in your life. You read and you learn from the billions of people who have come before you. And then when you get to this stage, you, you walk with a, a supreme humility and gratitude. You have this brand new grace for life. Stage three is what the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur calls a second naivety. It's almost like the, 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 the brightness in the eyes that you see in a child. Now, my son is five years old and anybody with kids around here, you're gonna understand when I say both my pain and my joy is found in my son's favorite word. Uh, second favorite word, his first favorite word is booger butt. But I'm saying like the, like the favorite word that, that he could actually say without getting in trouble is why. Why, right? That's why I said pain and joy because sometimes it's just trying to get around bedtime, Right? But then there's these moments when my son asks why, and I'm amazed by his curiosity. Dad, why does the moon rise and fall the way that it does? Well, son, uh, I don't know, you know, like that's just what it does. Well, why? Uh, the, the, the gravity. Well, why gravity, Dad? It's beautiful. But the difference is with a second naivete, you're, you're wiser now. You've walked through the pain of being let down by the people who you should have been able to count on. You wear the scars of past struggles and mistakes. And sure, you've experienced your fair share of cynical moments, but you've come through the other side with this outlook on life that's mature and that's honest, and it can be held still with passion and conviction. The problem is when we look at our world, we live in a stage one and a stage two type culture. There's very little stage three. You have stage one conservatives who tell you that the Bible says it and that's it. And if it's written, that's what it says. No idea what it means, but that's what it says. It's like one thing you're forgetting is this thing called interpretation. And people have interpreted the Bible differently throughout the years. But you have some people who say that's just the way that it, that it is. And then you have your your stage one liberals who say, go ahead right now, pledge allegiance to all that is culturally relevant. And if you don't, you're a bigot or, or something worse. And there's two sides, but they're both saying the same thing. We're right and nothing else matters. But for the most part, in truth, we live in a stage two society. I make it a discipline to have faith conversations just about wherever I go. And it's funny, the last three meaningful ones that I've had have been with three totally different individuals, but it's ended up uh, getting to the exact same place. One was with an older white gentleman from north of Birmingham. The other was with my Cambodian barber. Welcome to Houston, amen. Um, <laughs> and then the other one was with uh, my 22-year-old Italian Uber driver from New York who was living in Orlando. And it's interesting, when we started to talk about faith, uh, everything was incredible and they were open and they were, they were honest and, and we were having these conversations and each one of them got emotional. A couple of them start, started to tear up and you saw the, the true genuineness in the conversation. But then when the, when the conversation landed, we ended up in the exact same place, all three of them from three totally different environments. They each expressed that their ideology when it comes to faith is one that had more doubt than certainty. One that had more, more skepticism than faith. They, they were open, but they really had no clue. And they knew there was something, but they felt like it was too difficult to say exactly what that something was when you were talking about the spiritual realm. But this is our culture. Like, look around us. There's more doubt than faith. 
There's more, there is more skepticism than certainty. Very few people ever get to the beauty of stage three where they can walk in the conviction of their faith but still hold with humility a lot of the paradox that's required when you're following the way of Jesus. But in those moments when we're let down by our faith and things don't happen the way that we expected them to, The prayers for healing fall flat. We lose somebody close to us way too fast. In those those moments when somebody whose friendship we were supposed to be able to count on lets us down, a faith leader falls and we say, oh my goodness, what in the world is going on? How can I trust anything I was supposed to be able to trust them? It feels like in those moments when we're hurt the deepest, especially when we're walking in faith, It's like Jesus is showing up on the shores of our life like he did with Peter. And it's a whisper. And he says, listen, can we begin again? I don't want to start over. But can we begin again? Let's pick back up in the story in John chapter 21. This is after that moment when Peter sees Jesus and the catch happens and the fish are there and Peter is starting to recognize what's really going on. And then the disciple who Jesus loves said to Peter, he says this in verse seven, it is the Lord. And then as Simon Peter heard him say that, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he he had taken it off and then he jumps in the water. And the other disciple followed in the boat, towing a net full of fish for they they weren't far from the shore, about a hundred yards. And then when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring back some of the fish that you've just caught. So Peter brings back some of the fish um, and it was full of large fish, 153 to count them. But even with so many fish, the net wasn't torn. So then verse 12, this is really, really important. Maybe the most important verse in this scripture. It says, Jesus said to them, come and have One more time. Come on, wake up. Come and have breakfast. If you're in South Alabama, he said, come and have Waffle House, right? (laughs) Folks in Houston, we don't even know what that is, right? You're like, what? You've been to IHOP before, you know? Um, He says, come and have breakfast. Come eat with me. We touched on this earlier, but uh, so many people when asked what made them leave church cites a person or they cite a pastor, And while that's sad, you know what that tells me? If the number one reason why people leave church is a person, that lets me know the number one reason why they could come back could be a person. If a person can make them leave, and as long as it wasn't God, guess what? A person can make them come, come back. In a book highlighting some of the issues causing the mass exodus that we're seeing in church, this book is called The Great de-churching, um, the authors, they cite research and they say that the number one reason why most of the people who have left church would actually consider coming back, it's simple. It's not theologically deep. They said they would come back if somebody that they knew and loved invited them. Like, that's crazy. Or in other words, what research for leaving church and coming back to church is trying to show us is how incredibly important relationships with people are to our relationship with God. And when I look back at this story that we were walking through, it's wild to me that one of the first things that Jesus does after finding the disciples scattered back to their old profession, doing the things that they were doing before they ever met him, the the first thing that he does is not scold them, He doesn't test them on theology. He doesn't read scripture. He doesn't preach a sermon. He doesn't send them a YouTube link. He cooks for them. He he makes them breakfast. This is a theme that we see consistently throughout the ministry of Jesus. But some of the most formative moments in his time here on earth were had around a meal, around a table, not just in the temple, What most theologians and thinkers highlight is that the reason why Jesus does this is because he's trying to show us that his first and most important mission is to restore relationship. The second thing that I see Jesus doing when dealing with the disappointment that comes 
after the crucifixion specifically in his disciples, but then also the disappointment that comes for us in our faith journey. The second thing that I see him doing is I see him giving us a call to community. He gives us a call to community. If we go back and look in the book of Hebrews, you could argue that this book itself was written for the the Jewish Christians of that day who were deconstructing. Because if you open the book over and over and over again, the, the writer encourages them to hold to sound doctrine, to not leave the faith, to not go back to what they were doing before they had met Jesus. He over and over and over again says, stay in the faith. And then he says this in chapter 10, verse 23. I'm gonna read through verse 25. It says this, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. He says this, but encouraging one another more and more as you see the day approaching. He says this, don't stop meeting up. He says, don't don't stop gathering together. The The writer in this passage is giving the church a blueprint for holding on to their faith. He says, keep meeting And listen, I love church online. Church online, folks, I'm not beating y'all up. I love it. Like, I I love baseball tournaments, and I I think vacations are cool, but I wonder if one of the reasons why why the church in America seems to be spiritually anemic at some points is because most of us only come once a month when it's convenient. And hear me, I'm, I'm I'm not beating you up. This is not something I want from you. I'm trying to encourage this for you. I get it, we're all busy, but but shouldn't our souls demand weekly care? Maybe multiple times a week? Maybe in different versions of relationship? And I'm not just telling you to show up to church to hear a sermon and a great great worship team and to get your coffee and no, no, no. Church is not just happening here in the temple. It's gotta happen around tables. Jesus places such a high value on relationship. Why? Because being with the people of God actually is also being with the person of God. How do I know? Matthew chapter 18, what does it say? Wherever two or more are what? Gathered, there I am in your midst. Or in other words, we don't just come to church to sing. Small groups aren't happening just because they're trendy. No, there's something supernatural When believers gather together, what's the supernatural thing? God tends to show up. But it's this vicious loop that I actually think the enemy understands and plays on very well. Because the last place that you want to be when you're struggling with the faith crisis and you're doubting your faith and you're dealing with the disappointment that comes with the the hurt at church, the last place you want to be when you're dealing with all of that is church. Church. Consequently, the most important place you need to be when you're wrestling through your faith journey and trying to understand this walk with Jesus is church. But that paradox there often keeps most people away, and I get it. Why show up to a place that has consistently brought you harm? Why show up to a place that's failed you over and over and over again and then you have all of these other inputs telling you how messed up and how wrong the church is and how out of line and out of order and and, and, and misinformed and misaligned. All this stuff that's happening in our ear matched with our experiences of hurt and pain at church and they seem to line up. Why show up to a place that continues to hurt you? Well, because Matthew chapter 18 says so that's the way to experience the presence of God. Jesus calls us to community. Here's my last thought. One of the things that I feel like we have to begin to understand as Christians is that there are people around us who are deconstructing, who are pulling apart their faith. And can I, before I go on, can I just encourage you with something this morning? Maybe you're not deconstructing yourself. Maybe you're not dealing with the disappointment of your faith journey, but you know somebody who is in this entire message. You've been thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, I can't wait to text Billy. Can I encourage you with something? If you have a person in your life who's deconstructing, your first step is not sending them a link to this message. 
It's not. Maybe your first step, if we can go back to what Jesus did, is to make them breakfast. Wait, some of y'all can't cook. Why don't y'all go, go to breakfast? But I'm serious because if somebody is deconstructing, they don't need a better sermon. They've heard them all. They don't, they don't need a better worship leader. What do they need? They're, they need you and me to be more honest, humble followers of Jesus, willing to do what scripture says in Ephesians chapter 4, 12. They, they need you to come and be equipped to not just be church when we're here, but to go out and be the church and to have conversations and to have coffees and to let them doubt and to let them cry and to let them wrestle with their faith, because the truth is, if you've ever met somebody who's deconstructing, they don't actually want to leave the faith. They just can't make sense of why somewhere that's supposed to bring healing only has brought them hurt. So why don't you show up and be God's presence of healing for them? And it's not preaching doctrine down their throat. Sometimes it's just making breakfast. Here's my last, here's my last thought. One of the last things that I see Jesus do in his relationship with Peter as he's dealing with disappointment is he gives him an invitation to devotion. John chapter 21, verse 15, it says this. When they had finished eating, after Jesus made them breakfast, right? Um, after, after they finished eating, Jesus says to Peter, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? What a question. He says, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, then feed my lambs or feed my sheep. Again, Jesus says, um, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And then he answered, Peter answers, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then Jesus says again, then take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him again, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And then Peter answers, this time he was hurt. He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Check Jesus' response. He says, then go feed the sheep. Now, I usually give preachers a hard time for pulling out the Greek and the Hebrew because I'm always like, we get it, bro. You're smart, okay? You know. <laughs> but this is one of those moments where I think it's actually applicable, okay? Um, if you go back into that passage of scripture, John chapter 21, I wanna show you a couple of things. Notice what it says. It says, Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? But in the English language, love is one word. For instance, I love ice cream. I really do. Like I don't have a ton of sin issues that I haven't worked out lately, but mint chocolate chip is one of them. <laughs> like I just can't have it in my house. I just love it. But I also love my daughter. Those aren't the same things. But in the Greek, you don't have to speak the language long enough to begin to understand the nuance. They give specific words to specific things, especially when talking about love. So in the Greek, if you look back at this passage of scripture, when Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? He uses the word agapo, which you understand. You've heard the word agape. It's this all-consuming, unconditional, crazy, fulfilled devoted type of love. But notice this, when Peter responds, yes, Lord, you know I love you, he actually uses the response of the word phileo, which you know as Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. So, so check this out. Jesus says, do you love me? Are you committed? Are, are you in? Is the mission still resonating with you? Are you gonna stay with us? Are we gonna do this thing? And Peter says, yeah, you're my dog. He says, no, no, no. Jesus says, no, no, no. No, like, are you in this? Can I count on you? Can we be the church? Can we stay connected? Can, can, can we do this thing together? Come on. And Peter goes, yeah, yeah. Jesus, I love you. You can almost hear him saying, Jesus, I love you. But man, the baggage is too much. It hurts too much. I mean, Jesus, I love you, but all those people that you've preached to, they turned your back on you. They turned their back on you, Jesus. And Jesus says, I get it. Just feed the sheep. And Peter says, no, 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 you don't get it. They crucified you. 
They ruined everything. They messed all of this up. I'm not going back with them. Jesus says, go, go be near the sheep. And Peter says, finally, but my heart hurts too much. I thought that the three years of ministry with you were gonna end differently and I don't know, Jesus. I'm dealing with the disappointment of the fact that I can't match my faith up to the reality that I've experienced and Jesus says, you wanna find healing? Go be near the sheep. I know it's messy. I know it's broken. I know y'all don't share the same ideology. I know people in culture are probably gonna think that you're lame and weird, that you're still connected to a faith journey that they've long since left for smarter, better, prettier things. He's saying, I know what the world is telling you, that you can show up online once in a while and that's engaging with the church. I know that, that everybody else tells you you're supposed to be able to find a church that fits all of your preferences, that looks like what you want it to look like. And Jesus says, yeah, but listen, if you could just be near the sheep, you would experience healing because check this out unity is not uniformity you don't have to look alike to be healed alike and all you have to do is jump into the community and I promise you it's going to look different and here's what here's what I'm not doing I'm not advocating for a blind faith that doesn't hold church leaders accountable for doing things at church that aren't supposed to be done. As a matter of fact, if you, if you take your faith as seriously as I'm talking about, you'll hold them even more accountable. And you'll deal with sin even more strict and honest and clear, but with grace. I'm not telling you that church is not void of things that need to change and be shifted. Can I tell y'all that as a church, City Hope included, give Eden Church two more weeks, we will too. We'll have to deal with some stuff that's out of balance. Why? Because people are there. And the church as a whole, especially in America, there's healing to do, there's work to do, there's restoration that needs to be done. But John chapter three calls the church the bride of Christ. We're the remnant. Or in other words, I don't see a version of following Jesus that doesn't involve following him with the body of believers. You just can't back it up with scripture. And I'm not even preaching at you to find this church to be your church. I'm saying find your church to be your church. And if this is your church and you call it your church, but you're only here every other weekend, but you're not in a small group, you don't serve, you don't give, you're not actually involved in the life of the church, you just come because it feels like a rock concert and you can hear a solid communicator, you don't go to church here. You can tell people you go to service here. But again, I'm not trying to beat you up. Because I get it. There are moments when I wanted to walk away. I don't work here anymore, so I can be honest with Pastor Dale. From City Hope. <laughs> but I stayed. Because hurt is healed better with family. And if you're hurting, you're deconstructing, there's so much grace for you, there is no judgment. Maybe you even need time, I get it. But can I encourage you that the moments that you're away, the enemy is trying to plant seeds into your mind, that you can live life better without having to deal with church? Maybe that's true, but you can't live your next life better. Because the tenet of faith that we believe in that holds so strongly to our, our conviction is that this isn't the only life. We don't live to make this life better. We live because there's resurrection coming and that's the perfect life. I can deal with suffering in this life if it means that. And there's no honest understanding of Jesus Christ without, without the promise of bodily resurrection. So maybe you do need time. There's so much grace. But let me encourage you, take a step. I've heard this quote before, the local church is the hope of the world. I love it, it's a solid quote, but sometimes what gets lost in that quote is that the local church is also the hope for me and for my family. The world's not reached through the church. The world is reached through the church equipping its people 
to go reach the world. Can we pray? If you're here, there's two action steps I wanna give you. If you feel like this message is resonating with you, there are two things I wanna encourage you to do. The first one is this. Maybe you're here and you need to rechurch or re-engage or reconstruct. I don't know what that word is, but you know that you're, you're attending a church or you're watching online and you just go. You don't give. You're not a part. You're, 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 not, you're not involved in a small group. Nobody really knows you. The, the relationships aren't intimate. You've been hurt, so you're standing at arm's length. There's grace and I'm praying so hard for you. Praying that God renews your heart. But if you're ready to take a step, here's the step. Re-engage. I know it's messy. I know it's not gonna be perfect. Everybody doesn't look like you. Re-engage. And it is a simple step. I'm not gonna make it complicated. Maybe you don't even need to pray because the prayer has been prayed for you. Maybe after service today, you need to stop by the Connect Center and you need to just ask them, how can I do that? Is there a small group that I can join? Can I serve? Can I just be a part of something? Because I need to re-engage. I need this church that's been my service to really be my church family. Second one is this. Maybe you know somebody in your life who is deconstructing and the entire time you're wearing the weight of them walking away from their faith. Maybe it's time for you to take a step. So if the first step was re-engage, the second step is some of y'all may need to reach. Sending them a link to this sermon it does not constitute as a reach. Maybe you need to have breakfast. So right now where you are, if you're that second person, I want you to pull your phone out. Nobody's looking around. And I want you to make a list right now. Don't wait. If that's you and you know somebody who needs to re-engage with Jesus, I want you to pull your phone out and I want you to make a list because it's permanent when you make a list. You're gonna have to look at this. Did you do it? Did you reach? Did you have breakfast? Just to give them a safe space for relationship. Father, I pray for the moments that are gonna happen because people are responding to your word. Not just because they heard a great word and clapped a few times. Who cares? If there's no action behind what you're calling them to do. In the name of Jesus, I pray a special anointing. The same, the same special anointing you gave Moses and you gave Saul and eventually you gave David and then passed on to Jesus, that same anointing of supernatural spiritual wisdom, I pray that that's over our conversations with people that need Jesus. A special anointing for wisdom in this place for the conversations that are gonna happen. Father, we thank you so much. It's in your name we pray. We thank you for the church. It's in your name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Can we just celebrate all the people that are gonna take steps today? Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in and, and for experiencing this service with us. What we find in Scripture is an encouragement not just to be hearers of the Word, but doers of the Word. And the encouragement that we want to leave you with in light of that is don't let this just be content. You see, on this platform, you'll see a lot of content. There's a lot of things that can fill a lot of your time, but we want this to be more. We want this to be life transformative in the next step that it sets up in your life. On the screen right now, you're going to see a QR code just kind of flash up there. We'd love for you to scan that QR code, and what it's going to be is it's going to help you find that next step to connect with us. And in that, we can help direct you to whatever is that next step in your life to connect you, not just with content, which you found, but also with the body, with other believers, with people who are walking the same journey, whether it be from a place of honest questions and doubt to a place of, hey, I want to grow and mature in my relationship with God. But we want to thank you for tuning in with us. We love spending the time with you, and we'll see you later.